All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Gregory Winfrey, uh, Agency Director for the Texas A&M Transportation Institute. Um, Long-time colleague and friend, yeah, we're yeah. thrilled to have you here. Well, thank you. Um, Greg w has been with academia now, he's been with private sector, he's been with the public sector, so he has the perspective for, from all three. Um, he spent, um, he's, he joined the U.S. Department of Transportation's Office of the Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology in March 2010, mm -hmm. and that's the office that oversees the UTC program. Uh, and he was uh, chief counsel and then later sworn in as the assistant secretary in January 2014. Um, he also served as the deputy administrator and administrator um, of RITA when uh, OSTR was called RITA. And prior to his USDOT appointments, he served in um, industry as corporate counsel for several Fortune 500 corporations. Yeah, yeah. Welcome. Oh, well, thank you Good so much. You. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Elif Teriadu and uh, the UFTI community for allowing me to visit uh, with you. Uh, and as my abstract kind of pointed out, um, we'll be talking a little bit about an intellectual reset for intelligent transportation systems. But before we get started, just a couple of quick observations. So as you know, I'm out at uh, Texas A&M uh, in Brazos County, Texas. And uh, it is one hour behind, time zone wise. So I never changed my watch. So I'm standing here saying, how are we going to fill the next 45 minutes until we get started? So <laughs> I didn't realize we're already uh, well upon the time for us to visit. And my other observation is you guys are serious because I have not seen a hand crank pencil sharpener in quite a while. My mother was a New York City school principal where that was a standard issue. So. When they tell uh, folks here in Gatorland to sharpen their pencils, you guys take it apparently quite seriously. <laughs> so uh, just a little bit of a reflection. As you heard, I was the Assistant Secretary for Research at USDOT, uh, the successor to the agency known as RITA, the uh, Research and Innovative Technology uh, Administration. And that was started under the Mineta Act in about 2005 when Congress aggregated all of the science and data parts of USDOT into one organization. Uh, and it was an extraordinarily interesting organization because of its breadth, its depth, and its reach. It did a lot of the, what I called sciencey parts of the uh, department that didn't have a home in any particular operating administration. So just to run through, for example, I'm going to be talking today about the intelligent transportation systems. There was a joint program office that aggregated that effort in the department under uh, one roof. Uh, the important role or the role for which the uh, organization was originally started was for research collaboration, right? So as custodians of taxpayer dollars, uh, I wanted to make sure, and our mission was to ensure that federal rail, maritime, and FAA didn't have individual solar programs. It's like, hey, if you're going to be looking at that technology, we were tasked to know what's going across the, on across the department and say a better way to be custodians of taxpayer dollars is to have one program with multiple deliverables. We'll bring together the best and brightest from all of our teams, and we'll have a more robust program that's able to get those deliverables. So that was the research coordination role. We also have the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. Many of you have used uh, their data uh, products over the years, uh, a lot of surveys, a lot of statistical analyses on behalf of the department, principally in areas that didn't fall within, again, modal responsibility. Uh, so that was another huge factor. And then we had external offices, the Volpe National Transportation System Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's an organization that's analogous to what TTI is. So it is a soft money sponsor-driven uh, organization. It, re it receives zero funding from the legislature, so it's eat what you kill. Uh, that's largely how we operate at TTI as well. We do get approximately 13 percent of our funding from the Texas legislature, uh, but once you factor out uh, designated and mandated programs, there's a de minimis amount of dollars, uh, important dollars. Let me not have a Texas legislator think i calling their dollars de minimis, but when it all factors out, at the end of the day, comparatively, compared to what our sponsor-driven projects 
uh, bring in, it is probably uh, a single digit percentage for us to carry forward uh, as an organization. Uh, we also have the Transportation Safety uh, uh, Institute in Oklahoma City, and again, as the name implies, it worked with the various modes on increasing the safety profile. So that's kind of what we did uh, at USDOT. But there were a couple of areas in which I became uh, critically involved and uh, as a result became one of the uh, voices uh, that was seen to be uh, a resource and an expert in, in these areas. And one of them has to do with intelligent transportation systems. Now, um, some of you may have gleaned from uh, my bio that I'm a lawyer by training, which is why there was no PowerPoint behind me. I know you're all, as engineers, familiar with PowerPoints and data presentations. Uh, I was a trial lawyer, so my background is to talk and paint pictures with words. So I will do my best uh, to keep you all engaged as we uh, move forward through this discussion. Um, so having said that, so intelligent transportation systems, what does it mean? How did it originate? How long has it been around? Uh, it literally started back in the uh, 1990s with uh, the testing of communication technologies that would help vehicles talk to one another. So that's V to V, vehicle to vehicles, that would have vehicles talk to infrastructure, so that's V to I, and then ultimately V to X. And what does that X mean? The X literally was everything. It would be a communications network that allowed for the safe, uh, uh, safety in the users of our roadways from those who were in vehicles to those who are pedestrians or other vulnerable road users. So that's what the V to X uh, component applies to. So you'll also notice in the abstract it says connected autonomous vehicles. Well, I want to take a step back because at USDOT, we identified autonomous vehicles as vehicles that are currently on the roadways, but they're using driver assistance technology to help human drivers traverse the road more safely. So what do I mean by that? Automatic emergency braking, right? This is a fairly new technology, but what it does is the vehicle will apply the brakes and avoid a crash if the driver has not done so in a meaningful fashion or is uh, otherwise um, uh, not, not visioning the situation that, that's occurring before him or her. Uh, adaptive cruise control, right? So this is cruise control, as you all know, that speeds up and slows down and it maintains a safe following distance from the vehicle in front of it. We consider that, again, a driver assistance technology. And also lane keeping, right? So vehicles that now stay within their lanes or help the driver uh, maintain the center point of the lane, those are all autonomous technologies and those are here now. So the distinction was, when you talk about self-driving cars, what do you call them? So we call self-driving cars automated technology, right? So the proper term should be connected automated uh, systems or connected automated vehicles. Autonomous is already here. The next level is automated or self-driving vehicles. So keeping that uh, distinction uh, in your mind, uh, it falls in and out of usage depending on whom you're conferring with, but I can tell you it, it means something at USDOT. So as you start to talk to those professionals going forward, just be mindful of the distinction and the importance and the distinction between autonomous versus automated. So that now presents the question. I talked about connected vehicles. Now connected vehicles uh, and, the, and the communication technology dedicated to it dates back to about 1997 when the Intelligent Transportation Society of America, ITS America, lobbied FCC uh, and Congress for a <coughs> designation of a communications package that would allow for a low latency, and that means the ability to get a lot of data in a short period of time, uh, um, spectrum technology, wireless communications technology that could be Im implemented in this vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure, and ultimately vehicle to X, vehicle to everything space. And that was significant. Um, but the issue is it's been 15 years, 16 years, 17 years, 
since that spectrum was allocated, and now there are commercial interests that want access to that spectrum. Um, I will tell you that uh, the Wi-Fi companies are looking at the five gigahertz, and by the way, uh, dedicated short-range communications, V to V, V to I, operates in the 5.9 gigahertz space. There's 75 megahertz in that channel uh, that's been allocated for these communication technologies. And again, it's for the short-term, low latency, uh, uh, 10 times per second communication between vehicles that's transmitting information that helps the safety profile. Right, so this has now been under development all these years, but now uh, companies want you to be able to get uh, your Hulu faster. What we used to say at DOT is that's all well and good, but we don't want drivers entertained to death, right? So you're missing the, the driver safety and the occupant safety aspects of this low latency uh, signal if you um, allow for interference or allow for a competitor to come in and utilize that spectrum, ultimately crowding out the user. So why am I so negative about that? There's been some history. If you look at how uh, radio frequency spectrum, which is extraordinarily precious uh, real estate, has been allocated, there are instances in the past, uh, principally involving, let's say, FAA. And FAA had some spectrum dedicated for the development of terminal weather Doppler radar. But uh, a, a comp not a competitive, but a, a complementary usage was, well, hey, while FAA is developing that technology, maybe our companies that are in the garage door opener space can use that, and we won't interfere with each other. It actually happened here in Florida. Uh, there won't be any opportunity for, for interference or cross-pollination of signals. So the garage door companies went out and the market became flooded with these garage door openers. Well, when FAA was finally ready to turn on their TWDR, they hit the button and a whole bunch of garage doors went up down in Southern Florida, right? So now the, it, the argument became, well, FCC, we know they're the primary licensee, but you really can't expect us to recall all these garage door openers. I mean, these are out in the consumer public. We don't have any control over the users. It would be extraordinarily a financial burden for the users to try. So all of these economic and other difficulty arguments uh, put FCC in the position of having to say, well, we hear you. Uh, FAA, we know you're the licensee. We feel sorry about this and really badly, but you're going to have to move your operation. So when a sharer of spectrum is allowed into a space, there is a pretty significant opportunity for that sub-licensee or secondary license user to crowd out the primary license user uh, and have a oops, right, and a, and a mea culpa at a later date. So that's the challenge now with the companies that are saying, oh, but we can develop technologies that shares 5.9 and there won't be an, op an instance or an opportunity for our Wi-Fi routers to uh, engage with vehicles that have DSRC. Uh, but the problem, as you all know, is there is, on every street corner, there's a Starbucks. In every Starbucks, every Five Guys, every uh, local tavern is going to have one of these new routers. And one of these new routers is, like I said, is going to be at a corner and an intersection. And here in Gainesville, there's a whole lot of traffic. So at what point do you get to what we call denial of service, right? Where either the Wi-Fi can't work on a continual basis until maybe three in the morning when there are cars on the road, or the cars are, are denied service from this useful and critical life-saving technology that is DSRC. So that's a bit of the challenge from a spectrum policy perspective, and that's where folks in the academic uh, environment should be having their voices heard. The FCC record remains open on what to do with DSRC. Uh, NHTSA put out what's known as a NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, that talked about connected vehicle technology. But if you look at the language, uh, the, the, there is no attempt to, uh, I'll put it to you this way, it is technology agnostic. 
which is a fine way to approach uh, these kinds of events, but when you have a technology that's mature and that's been worked on for 15 years, that the industry is behind uh, both from an infrastructure uh, producer perspective as well as an automate, uh, the auto uh, OEMs, they've invested time and money uh, in that technology. It's a little disingenuous not to have a, a final rule that says, and we also want to make sure 5.9 is available for this life-saving technology, right? So get involved, look at the FCC record, lodge your comments and observations. Uh, again, DSRC is critically important from a safety perspective. NHTSA has estimated that it addresses up to 80% of unimpaired crashes, right? So if you look at the 2016 roadway fatality numbers, there's that pernicious level of DWI, drunk driving, uh, in, 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 well, and now you have to now start to expand that to some of the other legal factors that other states have um, incorporated. But impaired driving overall, uh, there are over 10,000 of those roadway fatalities. That's a number that needs to be addressed from a different perspective, right? These technologies uh, may prevent some, but we can't say uh, with certainty that up to 80% of those can be addressed. But in all the other types of crashes, and we're seeing an increase in uh, pedestrian crashes, a 9% increase. We've seen an increase in vulnerable road users. I'm a motorcyclist, so I'm concerned about an uptick in motorcycle crashes, uh, pedestrian and bicyclists. Bicyclists is up 1.3%. But still, the vulnerable road user categories have been on the rise, and this V to X helps improve that safety profile because it puts everybody into the communications mix with respect to where they are, uh, what their trajectory is, what their intended pathway is, and as you move into the vehicular side, it starts to give uh, advanced information about driver inputs, uh, et cetera, right? So that's a, a huge advantage of what DSRC uh, promises. Let me just pull this back. Uh, and, and again, it's that 5.9 gigahertz technology. Um, so why should connected vehicles matter? I think we just talked about all of the reasons why a connected environment matters. Again, when I was on the Fed side uh, visiting with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, they recognized that V to V, V to I, and ultimately V to X was the foundation of the Internet of Things. And that's how my office got to be the office that developed the Smart City Challenge, literally by having those conversations at the senior government levels about where this technology can migrate out from. So all of this is wrapped up in concepts about mobility, smart cities, and uh, connectivity going forward. Um, so some of the challenges now are uh, the, the reason the term connected automated vehicles was developed was, if you recall, in the 2011 time frame, Google principally and others started to introduce the concept of self-driving cars, right? And self-driving cars grabbed the media headlines. It was the bright, shiny object that Americans wanted to focus on. So the conversation now focuses on self-driving cars, automated vehicles. But the logical intercessionary step is the connected vehicle technology. And why is that important? A, again, connected vehicles talk to each other and reduce crashes. Connected vehicles talk to infrastructure for critical uh, uh, information about how to traverse the roadway safe, safely. But also, think about some of these facts. So the American vehicle fleet is at its oldest that we've ever had here uh, as a nation. The Ozzy and Harriet days of buying a new car every three years no longer exist, right? The, the impact and the effect and the lingering effect of the 08, 07, 08 uh, recession has forced folks to rethink what's important. So vehicle ownership now, the, the average age of the vehicle on the American roadways is 11.4 years. Right? And we've got 253 million of those cars out there. So connected vehicle technology promises to bridge what I've been calling the mosh pit era. 
Now, is everyone here familiar with slam dancing from the punk era, right? The mosh pit was that area right in front of the stage where everybody just kind of dove in and was body slamming, right? That's what our roadways are going to be as we start to incorporate self-driving vehicles. We've got 253 million of what I call analog vehicles on the roadways today. So just from a simple math equation, to overturn that fleet based on this average, it's going to take us 20, 25 years before we're at a point where we're at a majority of automated vehicles, right? So if you look at what Business Insider says, we'll have 10 million self-driving cars on the roadways by 2020. Well, guess what? We'll have 243 million non-automated vehicles on the roadways in 2020, right? So there's a lot of hype and mysteria built up about look where the numbers are headed. That's all well and good, but look what we'll still have to deal with, with legacy vehicles. And the way you make sure this mosh pit is managed as now I drive a 1988 Mazda RX-7 convertible, right? My next car, I'm looking forward to getting an airbag. I don't have an airbag, <laughs> you know, I don't have automatic braking, I got a car, right? So I like driving a car, but to me, you know, my, my next stage is, is what folks are, you know, already familiar with as these new cars come off the line. So there's going to be, you know, uh, technological vehicular Luddites like me driving these things. Think about all the folks who are still driving Model T's and Model A's, collectors, folks that are driving the muscle cars from the 60s. All of that stuff is still going to be on the roadway along with these little beep beep bubble things that drive themselves supposedly with no steering wheel and everything else that's coming down the pike. So that mosh pit generation that's ahead of us where all of this has to work together from a legal policy and technological perspective is quite challenging. And the way you do that is by the, the introduction of connected vehicle technology. So I can buy an aftermarket device or I should be able to buy an aftermarket device that's DSRC 5.9 enabled, right? Just like I can buy a Garmin or a TomTom Tom or a Magellan now and plug it in the lighter. Yes, I still have a lighter. I know they don't have those anymore. But the car should then be part of that environment that at the very least sends out a 10 times per second beacon of here I am, here I am, here I am. We call that a vehicle awareness device. So 10 times per second, I'm now part of the informational mix that uh, the world's smartest self-driving car is, right? I don't know where this guy's headed, I don't know what he's doing, but I know how fast he's going, and I know he's there. Right? So that increases the situational awareness matrix around a vehicle, right? So that's why these technologies are critically important as we start to have our fleet overturn and have more and more of these self-driving vehicles uh, on our roadways. And just so you're aware, this DSRC technology carries what are known as basic safety messages. So here are some of the messages and how they operate. There's a blind spot, do not pass warning, okay? So that means if I'm in my car and I'm behind a semi truck and I want to pass, let's say I'm on a two lane rural road, the way you do it now is you kind of peek out, whoa, somebody's coming. You peek out, whoa, somebody's coming. Well, with DSRC, uh, when vehicles are all similarly equipped, I will know in advance without having to do the poke and peek as to whether or not somebody's coming from an opposing direction. Or if I want to pull into the fast lane on a multi-lane multi highway and there's a Porsche coming up, you know, exceeding the speed limit, as they always do, uh, <laughs> I'll get a warning, beep, 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 somebody's in your blind spot, right? So that's what this communications technology promises to bring. Electronic emergency braking. Let's say you're in what we call a wolf pack. And it's a, it's, a, it's a procession of eight cars going at highway speed, sometimes, you know, a little too close nose to tail, and the second car or the first car slams on the brakes. How do you find out now? You don't find out until the vehicle in front of you starts to, and smoke comes off the tires, now it's a panic stop situation. Well, when DSRC is something that's been introduced to a wider uh, uh, proportion of the vehicles on the road, that first or second car, the minute they hit the emergency brake, you get a warning six, seven, eight cars back, and you know to apply your brakes to avoid a sketchy situation. So that's other technology that's been developed and it's ready to implement today. 
let's talk about forward collision warning. You're coming down the highway, and then all of a sudden the traffic uh, has, a, has a cue that's uh, coming to a halt. Maybe the lighting is bad. You've got the glare of the sun. You'll get a warning that you've, uh, you're approaching a forward collision uh, situation and that you need to start to apply the brakes. Here's the worst for a motorcyclist. Left turn across the pathway. What that means is somebody on a two-lane road or any, you know, any uh, uh, surface street uh, wants to turn into the Krispy Kreme. And I'm coming from the opposite direction. M motorcycles are low conspicuity vehicles. You got plenty of scooters here. On, you actually have more scooters than humans here on campus. That's quite impressive. But that's a low conspicuity vehicle, right? If you're looking, sometimes you can look right at it and not see it, or you're not gauging the speed. So in a connected vehicle environment, if I'm about to make that left turn and somebody's coming and I don't see it, I will get a warning. Uh, some of these manufacturers have had it that you have a haptic warning in your seat. Your seat will vibrate. You'll have other flashers, uh, and in some instances, it'll connect with the safety systems in the car, the autonomous system. So your car will lock the automatic emergency brake and not allow you to, uh, you know, get in front of the oncoming vehicle. That's a huge saver because the left turn across path is the most critical. Uh, pathway to motorcyclists, fatalities, and injuries. Also, red light runner. You're at a stoplight. Light changes green. What do you do? You go. Well, if there's a dump truck, let's say, that's coming from, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the side street, and he or she can't stop the dump truck in time because they were trying to make the yellow, but it's a full load, now they're not going to be able to stop the brakes in time or stop the truck in time. With connected vehicle technology, you'll get that warning. So rather than pull out and put yourself in harm's way, your vehicle will say, hey, there's somebody that's about to run this red light. Don't enter the intersection. Again, common sense safety, basic safety messages that could be implemented right now. And I would also add work zone warnings and curve warnings. And think about work zones. How complex are they? A lot of times, the lines in the road are, are uh, milled away or there's cones, it's a tricky scenario for a human to navigate. Well, how is a self-driving car going to do that? Self-driving car, right now, technology is machine visioning, largely looking at the uh, road striping, the edge striping and the lane striping. Well, if you take that away, now a self-driving vehicle has difficulty navigating the environment. And I can tell you, I would not want to be a roadway safety worker in a work zone when an automated vehicle is coming, right? Because I'm not assured that that vehicle could see me. But some of our international partners who work in this space, principally in Asia, have been developing chipsets that kids can put in their backpacks, right? So now kids are part of the DSRC environment. And as you know, kids tend to be a little shorter. They pop out from all kind of interesting and obtuse angles. But if your vehicle is now aware that, hey, there's a child that may be trying to cross this intersection uh, another school kid, you know, there's a pack of school children here that erases that awareness. Well, that technology could be put into the day glow vest that our roadway workers use now to give vehicles the situational awareness of human workers in, in the work zone. Critical issue with the number of folks that we lose uh, working in that capacity on an annual basis. So again, DSRC, it's 300 millimeter radius, 360 degree conspicuity, uh, it could see around corners, right? Nobody's talking about self-driving vehicles being able to see around a corner. That's a, that's a challenge that they have not addressed, and that's a challenge that I submit will carry forward if these vehicles continue to operate as self-contained uh, computational devices, right? So seeing around corners is key. It's also operational in all weather conditions. Again. Self-driving vehicles have difficulty seeing the lane stripes in inclement weather, whether it's water, whether it's snow. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we get to the nirvana of, of truly uh, repeatable, trustworthy self-driving systems. But again, that's why I'm talking about this connected vehicle space so, so vehemently. And also, if you think about it, self-driving cars use this Velodyne LiDAR, right? That's kind of the industry standard. Well, that LIDAR uh, was a 64-beam laser. It can only see 120 meters, right? So what is that, 396 feet? So by my math, uh, if you're going to go 
one second at 60 miles an hour, that's 396 feet, right? That takes five seconds to traverse. So a vehicle now has to start, uh, think, of, think about your safety cushion and, and what can happen in largely the length of a football field. Well, if you incorporate and augment that technology with connected vehicle technology, you now have that 300 meter radius, which is now an 11 second safety cushion uh, that would allow for several different uh, uh, outcomes. One, the vehicle self-corrects, or two, it gives the human driver time enough to re-engage, assess the situation, and pilot safely. So if you look at what NHTSA talks about, they say it takes between six and eight seconds for a human driver to re-engage uh, if he or she has not been paying full attention to the driving task, right? So do you want to look up? and see that it took the machine a second or two to figure out that, hey, it's your turn. Now you got three seconds to kind of get out of it. It's a very tricky situation where we are with the, how this technology is going to roll forth. Now, don't let me sound like I'm against uh, self-driving cars and self-driving technology. I have aging parents. Uh, at some point, we're going to all need to figure out how this operates. But my point is, let's take a measured and thoughtful approach to how this all rolls out and let's look, let's take an intellectual reset at what we had been doing prior to 2011 when what I call the hucksters came out with, hey, self-driving cars, and, and this is going to be great. It's going to be great, but let's take that step back and look at that next measured, logical, scientific approach to addressing roadway fatalities, 37,000 plus roadway fatalities. If we can knock 80% out of those unimpaired crashes, why wouldn't we do that? So that's my point about connected vehicles and the importance of that, what I call intercessionary step before we get to connected vehicles. So it's the time factor, it's the fleet overturn factor, it's the uh, investment in, in uh, saving lives. Uh, we wouldn't tolerate 1,000 737s crashing on an annual basis, but for some reason, that human total is what we tolerate with roadway fatalities. So we need to change our thinking about what we do as transportation professionals and think about the real-term consequences as, as we move forward. So that's kind of my soapbox about DSRC and connected vehicles, but I have another soapbox, and it has to do with GPS. So one of my other responsibilities when I was at DOT I was the co-chair, and this is a very long name, for the space-based, uh, oh, do, do, you know, do you know this one? The space-based SCOM? So it was the space-based positioning, navigation, timing, executive committee. Only in government would they come up with something that long. But uh, it was the formal committee for which the deputy of defense and the deputy of transportation had responsibility for bringing together a cross-governmental, um, uh, really a, a ministerial group to oversee and be responsible largely for GPS, right? So even though the title is expansive, space-based positioning, navigation, timing, there's only one system, and that's GPS. And GPS is critically important, as we know as transportation professionals, for the positioning and the navigation uh, aspects. But what is often not understood, and as you know, the, the, there are 31 satellites in orbit. There are 24 satellites that are part of the ongoing satellite constellation, and they utilize triangulation to help a individual uh, figure out where they are. But the key aspect to GPS is time. It's that fourth dimension. And every uh, satellite in the GPS constellation carries an atomic clock whether it's a cesium or a rubidium fountain, that all depends on the generation of the satellite. But these atomic clocks are calibrated down to the nanosecond. So that's what allows a person utilizing a handheld device to know where they are. You have to know, you have to know what time it is in order to know where you are because time and speed, as you know, impacts where you're gonna be. So that's how the GPS uh, system works. But interestingly, uh, it started out as a military system, um, and then in the 90s, under the Clinton administration, became made available to uh, the public 
for usage. And early in its infancy, uh, we had what was known as um, intentional uh, obduration of the signal. So you only had maybe a 30-foot radius to understand where you were. And then as time went on and the need for differential GPS, which was the, re the ability to refine the signal, went away, now more precise signals. So the GPS that's on your cell phone right now probably has an accuracy to within a two to three foot uh, circle. So that's very accurate. And again, differential GPS and scientific users are able to get it down to the centimeter or the nanometer uh, uh, um, accuracy. A lot of our precision agriculture relies on that. The ability to apply crops, the ability to apply uh, um, chemicals, uh, you know, um, agricultural chemicals, so that you have better crop yields and less environmental damage is a critical reliant upon uh, accurate GPS. Um, but importantly, international banking and finance, and I don't know how many folks here have an ATM card, but if you like putting that little card in the machine and having actual money come out, I know some of your students, that may not happen that often, but uh, sometimes mom and dad hook you up. But anyway, when you put that card in that machine and money comes out, that transaction is timestamped via the GPS signal. And more importantly, international banking and finance, the shifting of monies from banks and repositories and reserves around the world is only made possible by that timestamp handoff uh, that GPS provides. Accurate time to the nanosecond because there is a lot of tomfoolery that's occurred historically uh, with people being able to take advantage of time gaps, right? So if you send a billion dollars from uh, Tom's bank to, to Dr. Lilly's bank, and they send a billion dollars to each other, but there's a two-second gap, a three-second gap, somebody could get in there, manipulate, uh, you know, exchange rates or whatever else, and skim off you know, the, the, what we call the VIG in New York. They can get a nice skim and make free money, and these two would never know because the transaction occurred, but some evildoer got in there and figured out that if he or she could manipulate time, they could make a significant uh, income literally sitting at, at home at the computer. So that's what that time handoff does. It closes time so that there is not enough time for a bad actor to get in and interfere with the transaction. Same with the power grid. So when power is sent from substation A to substation B, as you all know, power is sent via AC, right, alternating current. Well, alternating current, by definition, is alternating. So you want to make sure your A is, is arriving in phase with your C when it goes from substation to substation. And the only way you can manage that is with precise time. Right? That's why we don't have substations and transformers that blow up anymore when, timing, when the timing is off for the transmission of high voltage power. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so, so those are just some of the critical usages that precise time has become relied upon across the globe. Um, so, so why is GPS important? It's important to us from a positioning and navigation but also that timing element. So what are the issues? There are actors out there uh, that have engaged cheap devices over the internet, jamming devices. Uh, so what they think they're doing is buying a device that creates a cone of silence. So we saw this uh, with some commercial drivers that wanted to go off the grid, right? Let's say they were driving for trucking company X Trucking company X has all of their uh, trucks from a logistics perspective monitored because of their waypoints via GPS. So some have said, well, you know, I, I want to go uh, to, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Jacksonville and I want to have lunch over at the swamp. So I'm going to plug this into my uh, system and it's going to give me a cone of silence and I'll be off the grid and when I get back to Jacksonville, I'll unplug it and then my, my employer will never know. The problem with that is these devices made overseas uh, and sold over the internet, I'm not encouraging you to do that because it is a federal crime uh, and FCC will uh, have some significant penalties. But this is what folks were doing a few years ago, buying these devices, thinking they were going off the grid. But there's no power regulation for these and the GPS signal is extraordinarily weak 
coming from space. I think it's 10 to the minus 15 decibels. So all you engineers can sharpen your pencils to figure out how weak that is, but it's an extraordinarily weak signal from space. So I would get, let's say, a, a, a 12 volt privacy device, plug it in, and because the power from that little transmitter was so much greater than the signal from space, it had the ability to knock out significant areas of GPS coverage or otherwise make it unreliable, right? So these are huge issues. Like I said, FCC and others are clamping down on the import of those, but that's something that's important to us to know as researchers that rely upon these technologies for GPS and for GIS related information. Uh, but also, there are state actors. Um, so it's widely known that uh, the country of South Korea relies upon our GPS that the U.S. provides, but North Korea has put jammers at the border. And if you look, there are military-sized transmitters that are literally trying to bombard the South Korean airwaves so that they can't take advantage of GPS. And it's had impacts at Incheon Airport and other airports uh, in Korea. Uh, some of those approaches no longer rely upon GPS. You know, pilots have to fly in the old-fashioned way because of the jamming activities going on uh, at their border above the 38th parallel. So, significant issues with respect to GPS availability and reliability. And GPS is also, because it is the gold standard, it is jealously um, coveted by other nations. So Russia has put up the GLONASS system. GLONASS uh, is not as reliable as GPS, but what the Russians don't want is to have to rely on U.S. technology. Right, so they've put up GLONASS, and, and one of the challenges now is, for those of you that have iPhones, iPhone actually uses, or has the ability, has a chip that's able to jump from GPS to GLONASS, depending on signal availability. So that's a challenge that the FCC has to address, because in order to have trans radio frequency transmissions into the U.S., you need a license from FCC. Well, Russia has said, we don't play that game. This is a global technology, and if you don't like it, tough. So the GLONASS signal is available here uh, in the U.S., and certain commercial manufacturers have taken advantage of that. Uh, there is a system from China, the Baidao system, that's being implemented with rockets uh, flying into space, and that, that constellation will be rounded out. So they're going to be competitors to GPS. GPS has the distinction of being an uninterrupted 24-7 uh, resource is probably a short-sighted way to look at it, but more importantly, a utility for all of these applications across the globe for well over 30 years, and it's something that we critically rely upon in the transportation space. But we need to understand what the threats are, we need to understand that reliability is always an issue, and we need to be pushing our government to develop complementary systems. So there's a document known as the National Security Presidential Directive, NSPD 39. That's the document that identified, that created the XCOM, the space-based PNT XCOM, uh, identified the Department of Transportation and, and, and Defense as the co-leads, but more importantly, it's the document that says the Secretary of Transportation shall, in concert with the Department of Defense, and the Department of, Home, Department of Homeland Security develop in, that, in that, that parlance a backup system to GPS. The modern way to think about it now is a complementary system, but that still has not been done. So our flank is very much exposed with the uh, fragility, uh, although it's reliable, of the GPS system. And uh, for those of you who remember the movie, The Day After Tomorrow, the environmental horror movie, I think a more frightening movie would be the day after tomorrow if there's a GPS outage. So, and I'm quite serious about that with as ubiquitous as GPS has come or become in our economy and in our way of life. So all of you brilliant scientists here, think about that, but think about technologies we can use to round out uh, our ability to have reliable uh, positioning, navigation, and timing data. So with that, uh, I've been talking for a little bit, but let me open it up 
to questions or any other uh, comments folks would like to make? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, down. <laughs> yeah, so th this whole notion around we're going to have autonomous cars very soon, and even my advisor argued with, this, uh, argued with him about that it's not going to be here as soon as people think, and it's not going to be as widespread as people think. Mm -hmm. Like, even 10 years from now, it won't be widespread. Uh, we have 1.5 billion cars worldwide that's, right. our, that's not autonomous, that's not fully autonomous, and only have, you know, level zero to level three mm -hmm. capability, according to SAE. Have you received like pushback uh, with presentations, uh, maybe not so much from NHTSA, but like from tech companies, maybe from like Apple or Google or Tesla or even, you know, a lot of automotive, like Ford yeah. has changed its approach in terms of, we're not gonna focus on the lower level automation. We're gonna, okay, let's go 99% full autonomy. Like, have you received yeah. pushback yeah. from these companies? And if so, what, yeah. what it's like? Well, I've certainly been involved with, with conversations uh, about this subject, uh, but they're commercial enterprises, right? They've got to build, you got to sell the sizzle before you can sell the steak, right? So from a marketing perspective, they're doing what they need to do. Um, they're certainly bullish on their technological capabilities, but, you know, I look at this from uh, a holistic approach. Um, looking through the legal lens and the policy lens. Even if the technology is here, we've got a lot of work to do legal and policy-wise to figure out how this stuff all works together, right? So, so I think my fallback with them is I don't disagree that the technology uh, is here. I disagree about the timetable, but I think the initial usages, and you hear this from other areas as well, uh, will be on controlled campuses will be at airports, will be fleet usage, maybe uh, taxi, Uber kind of services. So I think we will start to see that roll out on that limited basis, but it needs to be in environments at the outset that are controlled, right? So here in Gainesville, you've got 50,000 students and 160,000 people writ large. You could say, hey, look, keep your eyes out. We're gonna be testing these vehicles on our roadways You've got the ability to uh, communicate that information uh, to the folks who are here. This is how they operate. This is what to look for. This is how you know them when you see them. So to me, that's a relatively closed campus environment where that could be demonstrated safely. It's another thing altogether to try and come, I'm from New York, to try and come from Manhattan and you know just, just let these things uh, travel willy-nilly. So there's gonna be a need at that front end for some ongoing research in dynamic environments, closed campuses, and then perhaps you start to see fleet rollout. But, you know, the numbers I'm talking about with all of these uh, cars that are on the road, 11.4 average, that's just a matter of time and, and investment and, you know, helping folks understand and maybe starting to whet their appetites as to whether or not they want this technology. There's also a critical factor in looking at baby boomer aging, right? As they start to move, they're a more dynamic generation than we've had previously. So maybe the appetite gets whetted as those folks start to move uh, away from wanting to pilot their own vehicle. So there's a lot of factors built up, but from, I don't see a, a 2020, uh, you know, every other car on the road is, is self-driving and I don't think you're hearing anyone say that. Now 2030, you start to hear that. But to me, that's still a bit uh, aggressive. Yeah. No, sure, sure. Well, thank you, Greg. Oh, my, my pleasure. Question, uh, I see that many uh, transportation professionals in the administrative level are a big fan of DSRC because of the benefits that it provides. But uh, 
how do you perceive or maybe welcome uh, other channels of communication such as cellular? Because there are the next generations of cellular debatably can be as good or yeah. even better than mm -hmm. DSRC in terms of latency or startup time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what's the attitude towards it? No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, as I kind of hinted, although I'm a DSRC fan, I am a technology agnostic, right? So whatever communications technology is able to communicate these basic safety messages is, is the huge uh, plus up. But if you start talking about 5G, 5G is not yet developed. Whether or not it's capable of carrying these signals at the latency we need has not been proven. So my point is, uh, if you're looking at it from a technological continuum, if DSRC is the equivalent of Morse code, I tell folks, guess what, Morse code still works, right? So what we need is an aggressive step technologically to get this life-saving technology out there and get people acclimated to it. They don't care what the technology, if it's Bluetooth, if it's 5G, 6G, 9G, they don't care, and that's really not important. But the important thing is you have a technology that's at the 11th hour, 59th minute of implementation, why not get that out there now while we can start saving lives today? We can get human drivers familiar with what it does, what the warnings are, how to interpret the data that they're getting in a dynamic driving environment and start that. If it lasts for a year and then something else comes along, that's fine. But to me, to have invested all of that time and work to get to a point of implementation and not hit the go button is problematic for a number of, number of perspectives. Yeah. Enjoy your presentation as well. Oh, thank you. And uh, my fr my question is regarding uh, the direct, uh, dedicated, short range communications. Can you speak up just a little? Okay. So, I would like to find out if thought has been given to what kind of network architecture is going to be used to meet the um, bandwidth, the latency requirements. That's going to be necessary to facilitate the uh, real-time communications of these vehicles. Yeah. And uh, as someone was saying, maybe giving a 5G thought over uh, the direct short range, but it is possible that by using um, different types of uh, networking architectures, such as um, are the vehicles going to be doing peer-to-peer? -peer? Are they going to try to be connecting into the cloud? Or are we looking at mm -hmm. the um, edge computing using um, like fogs? Is that something that's being considered? And uh, yeah. if so, I would really like to find out where can I look more into this? Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and one more question yeah, to, sure. to, to piggyback on that is whenever you start talking about peer-to-peer -peer, um, interactions, you have this um, problem with trust. So um, if one vehicle is going to be saying to the other one, I'm coming, look out for me, how are we going to say, uh, prevent a bad actor, so to speak, yeah, yeah. to um, you know, break that trust and introduce right, um, right. faults? No, those are great questions. Um, from a resource perspective, I would direct your attention to uh, the USDOT page for the ITS-JPO. We'll just put in Intelligent Transportation Systems and it'll direct you to that. Part of it is under the prior organization name, RETA, Research and Innovative Technology Administration. Part of it is under the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Research and Technology. I don't expect you to remember that. Put in Intelligent Transportation Systems and you'll see the wealth of data that's been uh, posted by the ITS Joint Program Office. Uh, to your specific point about interoperability, um, some of the things I didn't talk about, but uh, over the 15 years this, that this technology has been in development, there have been several different uh, consortia that have come together to work in this space. So one is called CAMP, and that's the Collision Avoidance Metrics Partnership. So CAMP is an assemblage of eight OEMs that have come together in a pre-competitive fashion 
to develop all of the architecture and standards that you've talked about. Uh, they've worked uh, through IEEE, uh, through SAE, and other organizations through their internal experts to pull together that communications uh, interoperable uh, architecture to allow for this technology to work platform to platform, right? So your Bentley can confer with my new Hyundai with the airbags when I get it. But um, that's how that technology will work. So it will work across uh, platforms uh, by the OEMs. There's also been work across um, the industry uh, for some of the um, uh, infrastructure work as well as policy work through groups like VIC, the vehicular, I can't remember what the IIC stands for. That'll be in the website as well. So this, this work has been uh, in, in concert and consultation with USDOT, that's how the ITS um, community has developed here in the US, but also importantly, this is a global effort. So there is an ITS component in Europe, and there's an ITS component in Asia. So Asia focuses on congestion mitigation and tolling. Europe focuses on economical and ecological routing, and the principal focus in the US has been on safety. That's why I'm harping so much on the safety uh, aspect. So there's a lot that's been going on. Take a look at that ITS JPO uh, website, and I think that will kind of give you and guide you to the answers uh, that you're looking for, particularly and specifically with respect to the technological questions you raised as well. Did I answer the second part as well? Well, well you talked about bad actors. So there is a need in this enterprise to come up with what we call a security certificate management system, right? So think about the complexity with 253 million cars on the road. You can't have a car, you know, like your license plate that has one set code that says, I'm in this communications environment. There has to be some dynamism. And I think we said perhaps every six to 10 minutes, these codes uh, that allow access into the secured system need to be rotated, right? So we actually visited with the Harris Corporation, uh, the, the name sponsor of this hallway, about the proper way to do that and what does it look like to develop a, a security certificate management system. But through an SCMS, that's how you identify and control access to the system. That's how you detect bad actors and cyber threats and you boot that code out uh, and you, uh, you know, dispatch you know, your technicians to figure out what's going on with that SEMS identification number. But that's all part of this website uh, that you'll find and, and rich data stream on the web as well. Sure. That was an Aggie Giggum, by the way. <laughs> Completely lost. <laughs> Any other questions, folks? We're being kicked out of the room, so. <laughs> oh, we're getting kicked out? <laughs> yes, there's a, there's a reserve, it's reserved for an exam, so. Uh, okay. We have to end here, but right. thank you very much. Really appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice. Thanks all for coming. Thank you for coming.